Hold First, on. I just want to say. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, Jess. Um, hey, everyone. Welcome to today's Sharks for Kids uh, Marine Science Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'm Education Director with Sharks for Kids. Um, for those who don't know Sharks for Kids, we're uh, trying to bring ocean and um, shark awareness to classrooms across North America and beyond throughout the world. Check out sharksforkids.com if you haven't before. You'll find all kinds of curriculum to be used in classrooms, um, interviews with uh, videographers and scientists, marine biologists, um, games and activities. It's a great website. You can get lost there for a long time checking out the pictures and the videos. But uh, I'm thrilled today to be joined um, by Jess Cramp. Um, Jess is a scientist, she's a surfer, a diver, a pilot, a writer, a conservationist, and a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Um, she spearheaded an effort to establish a two million square kilometer shark sanctuary in the Cook Islands, and she also has a conservation group called Sharks Pacific, and they're a key player in the shark research and conservation. She's written for tons of publications, adventure magazines, um, National Geographic blogs, and she is an optimist. She's willing to put the time in to see these con uh, conservation projects through, to meet with the locals, and um, just keep a positive attitude throughout the whole process. So Jess, welcome to our Sharks for Kids Hangout today, joining us from the Cook Islands. Um, thank you so much for joining this group of classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Grabowski. Hi, everyone. My name is Jess Cramp, and I am a marine conservationist, shark researcher, and a National Geographic emerging explorer. I am talking to you guys today from the Cook Islands. Can you all raise your hand if you know where the Cook Islands are? Anyone? All right. <laughs> well, we're in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. We are um, several thousand miles south of Hawaii. So I'm literally talking to you from a dot in the middle of nowhere. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to tell you guys a bit about my story, um, how I got into marine conservation and how I became the crazy person that wanted to protect sharks. You guys ready? Yeah? Okay. Right. Okay. So first of all, I really just want to give you guys a big thank you, thank you for having me in your hangout. I know this is an important part of your school day, and so letting me talk to you is a really exciting part of my day. So I'm not a crazy shark lady. I wasn't brought up wearing a mask and snorkel. I grew up in a little mountain town in northeast Pennsylvania, playing baseball and running wild in the woods. I actually wanted to be a fighter pilot, as you can see in this photo of me as about a four-year-old. But when I was in college, um, I fell in love with surfing, and I wanted more. So I moved to San Diego, California, where I could surf and then also work on my career as a scientist. The lab work was really important to me. We were trying to discover new drugs for cancer and pain treatment, um, but it was entirely indoors, and I didn't want to do that forever. I was a wild kid, and I wanted to be outside, but I also wanted to build upon what I'd learned in the lab. So there's a scientific process, the importance of quality data, wanted to see what was happening on the ground and some of these interesting philanthropic efforts I learned about in magazines. By this stage, I'd been a biologist for about eight years. I had trained my brain, but it was really time for me to explore my heart a bit. So I did the unthinkable. I put a date on the calendar, I quit my job, packed up everything I owned, and set out on an adventure to drastically alter the direction of my future. I spent about a year volunteering for a few different organizations that I believed in, from post-earthquake Haiti, which is pictured here, um, to Guatemala and Panama. And then I landed in the Cook Islands. And once I did that, the experiences I had in the other places helped me realize how I wanted things to happen for conservation. At the end of my year-long journey, I sailed across the Great Pacific Ocean. It gave me time to reflect on the work I had done, but also the impact I wanted to make. I learned of an organization called Pacific Islands Conservation Organization, and the founder of that organization had a dream. He wanted to create a shark sanctuary, and so I decided to go and, and help him. During my sail across the Pacific, I had a riveting encounter with sharks. I was fascinated. I jumped off a boat with my surfboard to check out the conditions on shore of one of the islands we stopped at. And you know, being the explorer that I am, I always take a snorkel mask with me when I jump off the boat. And I looked down, and there were five bright yellow eyes staring back at me. I was being um, I was being followed by a pack of sharks on my way to the shore. But what's interesting is I wasn't scared at this stage. It really, really sparked my curiosity. 
And I had known at that time about shark populations and about how some of them were declining as, as a result of fishing, but I didn't quite understand the gravity of the situation. And this is what most people think of when they hear about sharks these days, which is really sad. So this is um, a large mako shark who is having his fin cut off. And this is um, for a delicacy in Asia known as shark fin soup. And I think what people should really think about when they, when they think about shark fins is actually look at the numbers here. Think about how many sharks are laying on this rooftop. Sharks are unfortunately being targeted and caught incidentally um, in other fisheries from the beaches to the high seas. But the demand for their meat, fins, oil, and other parts are accounting for almost 100 million sharks dying per year. Angel sharks, hammerheads, sawfish, and oceanic white tips are at risk of extinction. But it's important to keep in mind that it's not just shark fins. Shark meat consumption has risen dramatically in the recent years. But we all think sharks are fish, right? Can't we fish them like we fish tuna? No, unfortunately, because they reproduce more like mammals, sometimes even slower. Did you guys know that the spiny dogfish is pregnant for 22 months? Sharks take a really long time to reach sexual maturity. They grow slowly, and they have very few young, which are called pups. This makes them very vulnerable to overfishing and slow to come back when their populations are low. This information, for me, was essential to communicate in any shark conservation campaign. And so when I was in the Cook Islands, I wanted to use the science, which is what we just talked about, but also learn from local people how they felt about sharks. So we talked to Cook Islanders. We found local ambassadors and made them the faces of the campaign to create a shark sanctuary in the Cook Islands. There was a lot to do. We needed the science, but we needed to earn the trust of local people and to respect the local culture. We held a lot of meetings, and when we went into the communities to talk to people, we took our new shark ambassadors. So you'll see on screen, this is me with a fancy handheld camera. This is in the days before GoPro. And this is my friend, Danny Mataroa. Danny became inspired by the Shark Sanctuary campaign and, and chose to speak with us. Here I have a little video. Did you know that sharks have been around longer than dinosaurs? Did you ever wonder why? I feel it's because they have a very important part to play in the whole way of life. Like Lion King. Zumba. Yeah. Too late. Danny helped us inspire a lot of local people, including these local kids, on a tiny island called Mitiato in the Cooks. And we have fun. We use the shark fin on our head as an example of showing your support for sharks. And we even got um, support from some very unusual places. There was um, a leaders meeting where all of the presidents and prime ministers of the different countries came to the tiny island of Rarotonga that I lived on. And um, even Hillary Clinton came down. And, you know, coming from America, seeing Hillary Clinton is a big deal because in the States we can't get quite close to her. And when I saw her, I became a little bit possessed and jumped out and said, Hillary, I'm American. Um, she came out and she looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I explained to her that I was working for uh, shark conservation. And she had actually asked and said, well, is there anything I can do to show my support for sharks? And Hillary Clinton showed her support for sharks in the same way that the small kids from Mitiato did. She put a shark fin on her head. Um, what's quite interesting about this is while Hillary Clinton might be a big deal in the United States, down in the Cook Islands, people thought it was interesting, but they were more interested in what their traditional leaders cared about. And so this man on the left with his hands on his knees sitting next to me, his name is To'u Ariki. He is the king of the traditional leaders in the Cook Islands. It turns out, To'u, he gave us his support as well. And so all of these local fishermen you see in the background, while they don't have the shark fins on their head, they were really supportive of the effort to protect sharks. And soon after that, the Cook Island Shark Sanctuary was declared on December 12, 2012. And so not only did all of these folks join together to make it illegal to catch, to trade, to transship sharks and rays in the entire um, exclusive economic zone, which is all the waters that the Cook Islands claim their own. They also connected the existing shark sanctuaries in French Polynesia, American Samoa, and Tokelau. And so together, it became one of the largest contiguous shark sanctuaries on the planet. And while that was an amazing effort, 
I realized that these shark sanctuaries were really just a first step. I wanted to begin immediately researching the sharks to find out if these large shark sanctuaries that I had just spent the past couple of years working on were actually going to protect them. And if they weren't, I wanted to figure out a way to make it better. There was a big lack of data. How would we know if the sharks were being protected if we didn't even know what sharks were there and where they were going? And so I spent a long time trying to learn to do the science. Here's a picture of me tagging a baby silver tip shark in Fiji. And alongside learning the science, I wanted to include locals. This is my friend Jone. He works for the government of Fiji in their fisheries department. And we realized that when we learned, when we, um, when we combined the knowledge of the local people with the science, we came up with some interesting facts. We learned that there was a lot of shark fishing going on in Fiji. And combining that in science, we realized, okay, well, that's interesting because in two weeks' time, we had only caught four sharks in order to tag. And so we realized that more needed to be done. We couldn't just do science, and we couldn't just talk to the local people. It became clear that there wasn't time to wait. The scientist in me wanted more data, but the conservationist in me wanted to use that into action. And so I created a small organization called Shark Specific. And what we do is research, outreach, we try to um, come up with some interesting media campaigns, and then we do advocacy. And advocacy is where you try to come up with a, a political angle as a way to make um, lasting change through laws and through regulations. I also started my doctorate, so I started a PhD in Australia to study sharks and conservation. I wanted to know if these big marine reserves, if these shark sanctuaries were going to work. I did this so that I can become as informed as possible. I wanted to learn as much about sharks and about these policies as I could. And so here's a photo of me tagging a black tip reef shark in Australia in September. And then one day, the unthinkable happened. While I was busy trying to learn more about sharks and make sure these policies were created um, and they were effective, National Geographic had been paying attention. They sent me an email that said, congratulations, because of your hard work um, in marine conservation, we've selected you as a, as a 2015 National Geographic Explorer. At first, I thought it was a joke. Um, my life was already fun and very busy. But this opportunity gave me a lot more um, experience in the field and the ability to talk to classrooms like you guys. I worked with other explorers. Um, so this is a bit of an odd slide. Down in the left is a good friend of mine named Shaw Selby. I think you guys uh, may have had a hangout with him. Uh, and, and then my friend named Topher. These guys are engineers, and so they design equipment. They design equipment to solve world problems. And I also work to solve world problems, but from a very different angle. And so what this, what this buoy is, is a way to detect illegal fishing activity. So this buoy picks up the sound of fishing boats that are in an area where they're not supposed to be. And then it'll alert rangers or police officers that there are fishing boats in the area. And then we can try to catch the bad guys from doing things like catching sharks that they aren't supposed to. And on top of my own research and some of the fun stuff with National Geographic, I had a chance to go to the Galapagos. And for any shark person, the Galapagos really is sort of a dream place. Um, we went to these two islands called Darwin and Wolf, and they have the highest biomass, which means they have the largest number of sharks on the planet. The shark research was twofold in the Galapagos. This is a photo of me with a large pole with a tag on the end of it. And what we were trying to do was free dive, which means we were going to dive down with no scuba tanks to try to tag them. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in trying to tag them. And this is because the waters, uh, due to El Nino, were very warm. And the sharks like colder waters, generally. And so these sharks were much deeper. And unfortunately, I couldn't hold my breath deep enough to get to them. And then we also tagged sharks from boats. This is a, a photo of a silky shark near the surface. And unfortunately, when we were trying to tag all these sharks, we kept getting silky sharks. But here's another, here's a video I'm going to show you guys of a juvenile hammerhead shark. And this is another part of our research that we did called BRUVS. BRUVS stands for Baited Remote Underwater Video. It puts off a scent of fish oil and, and fish parts to sharks in the area. And when they come by to explore this pole, we have a chance to see what species they are and an approximate idea of how large they are. I'm going to show that one again. And I want you guys to think about how big you think this, this shark is. So this is a scalloped hammerhead shark, and we'll talk about it at the end of my presentation. 
I'm often asked, asked about whether shark research is dangerous, but let me tell you that the scariest part of my trip to the Galapagos in tagging and um, getting in the water with sharks was actually the first time I saw one of these strange creatures. This is a Galapagos marine iguana, and the first time I saw this, guys, was a bit unusual. Our team was on a Zodiac, which is, you know, a large rubber boat, headed to the beach for one of our very first land research expeditions. We had a lot of dry bags, we had all of our camera, our scientific gear inside these dry bags, and as we headed toward the shore, unfortunately our boat driver mistimed the set. And by set, I mean number of waves, and unfortunately a very large wave came in, it flipped our Zodiac, it sent all six of us flying in different directions, our gear went flying all over the place, and True to form, I had my mask with me, so as we were trying to pick up our gear off the seafloor, I put my mask on, and I saw my very first marine iguana. Another fun sort of, I guess, um, mis misfortune of this adventure happened in my very first submarine ride. I was sitting in the submarine, we're getting ready to go down 1,200 feet, around 400 meters on the seafloor, we're locked in this acrylic bubble, as you see, and I hear the submarine pilot say, uh-oh, one of the thrusters isn't working. Now, being someone that is adventurous but also quite nervous of very small, confined spaces, this didn't make me feel so good. But what did make me feel good was that our pilot was a woman, and our second scientist was a woman. So we had the very first all-female submarine dive of women in our stage of careers. And this was really exciting for us. We also had a chance to get in the water and swim with sharks. Here's a photo of me with a silky shark. And despite the fact that we weren't able to tag as many of these sharks as possible, being able to experience time in the water with them when they're calm um, is, is really a riveting experience. And it also brings me back to realizing that even though the shark work is very adventurous, it's important for all of us to keep the, the real task in mind. And that's to protect sharks from over-exploitation, which means that too many are being taken out of the water, and also to do our best to make sure that people both understand and care about their survival. And so this is what I do now with Shark Specific, with my PhD, with National Geographic, and what I'll be doing from now into the future. And so I want to say a big thank you for listening, and I'm ready to hear any questions. All right. Well, Jess, thanks so much for sharing. You have such an awesome story, and the message of... You know, if there's something that you want, that you, you just got to take that leap and go for it. I think that's really important for students. Um, so thank you for sharing that. We're just going to get a message here on my end, being in a school. There we go. Um, and those photos from the Galapagos looked amazing. You had me very excited for my upcoming trip this summer. So very cool. Um, I'm going to introduce the classrooms, and then we'll get some questions going. But we do have quite a few viewers who are just watching live. I can see along the bottom. So. If you're a classroom and you are watching live, please head over to the event page and send us a message. Let us know who you are, uh, what grade you are, and if you have any questions for Jess, put them up there and I might be able to get to a couple of them um, as we move through the Hangout. So uh, joining us today, we have, there we go, we have a group from Immaculate Conception, a grade six class joining us in British Columbia. We've got Mr. Moores with, I believe, some of Mr. Huang's grade twos and threes from Toronto, Ontario joining us. Mrs. Lasseter's fifth graders from Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, Miss Huddy's grade twos from Calgary, Alberta. And then we have uh, Miss B's grade fours from Guelph, Ontario. So actually just around the corner from me. And last but not least, we have some grade sixes. Mrs. Harshaw's uh, sixes from Dr. Davy Elementary in Hamilton, Ontario. So a great group of classrooms from across North America. And let's uh, get a microphone fired up. So Mrs. Uh, Lasseter, your group, your microphone's on. You have a couple questions. Okay, yeah, questions. When you first started, were you were you kind of nervous? Do you mean about getting in the water with sharks? Yes. Yes, because when I was growing up, I didn't grow up by the ocean. And so the only exposure I had to sharks was some of the exaggerated things they show on television of sharks with their teeth gnashing about and, you know, going up and biting these poor, you know, seals. And so naturally, I thought that sharks were always aggressive and always these killing machines. But what you realize is that sharks generally, they're really afraid of us. They don't get as um, spastic as, as the television might show unless you've really, really been putting a lot of 
what they call bait in the water or a lot of scent. And even then, it's really hard to get them to come close to you. All right, let's grab one more question from uh, our group. Okay, Marcus. Um, what's your favorite animal? My favorite animal is the hammerhead shark. They have developed an incredible ability to sense. Their eyes are really funnily out on the sides of their heads. They use their big shoveled head to, to pin down their favorite food, which are stingrays. And so they're my favorite because they're funny looking. They're incredibly um, resourceful. They use their head. And then they also have this amazing ability to detect electricity in the water. All right, great questions. Thanks, guys. Um, let's jump over to Alberta and our grade twos who are joining us. Your microphone's ready. Hey, Matilda. Um, I was wondering, what's the most endangered type of shark? The most endangered type of shark is actually called a sawfish. A sawfish may not look like a shark that you're used to seeing, but he's in the shark family. He has a long nose full of um, sort of spiky teeth called a rostrum, and they're very large. And because these teeth are so spiky, they get stuck in nets sometimes. And that's the unfortunate way that they die and the reason they're mostly endangered. Because as the nets come along, their rostrum gets them stuck, and then unfortunately they don't survive. As well, their fins are quite, um, are quite valuable. But these guys are really cool. I would encourage you to to look up a photo of one when we get off. I've actually jumped ahead to Google and I have one ready. I'm going to share my screen very quickly right. so you guys can check one out. There we go. And there we go. So this is a sawfish. He doesn't look like a shark uh, that, that we were used to seeing, but he does have a nice big dorsal fin. And then you see his long teeth. He used that to root in the mud and in the seafloor to get his food. All right, I'm going to come back now. There we go. And let's grab one more question from our grade two class. Do you want to or do you want to? Now, could you come to me? Quick. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah. What's the most endangered type of shark? That's what you just asked. You were asking how many sharks are there. Or wait, how many sharks are there? <laughs> In the oceans? How many types of in all of the oceans? Yep. Well, gosh, that's a really hard yep. question to answer. We don't actually know how many sharks there are in the oceans. But what we do know is that there are about 1,100 different types of species of sharks and rays. Um, and of all those sharks and rays, we only have enough data to know approximately how many sharks are left for half of those. So, yeah, there's a lot we don't know, and so there's plenty of room for all of you to grow up and study sharks because there's so much that we don't know. All right, great questions. I just want to give a shout out to two more classes who are joining us. They're watching the live feed. So we've got fifth graders from McNeil Intermediate School in uh, Wisconsin. So they're excited and they're joining in. And then we have a group of grade sevens joining us from Burlington, Ontario. So a shout out uh, to those classrooms. Um, let's see, let's visit Mrs. B's class uh, in Guelph, Ontario, so just around the corner from me. What is your favorite place to research sharks? Oh, that's a good question. I would get in trouble with all of my friends here in the Cook Islands if I did not say the Cook Islands. Um, but I think that the Galapagos, because there are so many sharks and they have my favorite type of shark, which is a hammerhead, I would have to say the Galapagos are probably right now at the top of my list. Do you know where the Galapagos are? Do, do you? Do you know where the Galapagos Islands are? No. That's okay. I didn't know that at your age either. They are off the coast of uh, South America and they belong um, as part of a country called Ecuador. So you guys should look at a map and try to find the, the Galapagos Islands. We'll give you a hint. Head to the equator. <laughs> All right, another question from our class from Guelph. Have you ever been hurt by a shark? I have not been um, hurt in the sense that 
you know, I, I needed any medical attention. But sharks have this really cool skin. Um, they're called dermal denticles, and they're really they feel like sandpaper. And so, strangely enough, I would watch all of my mentors in shark research wear long sleeve shirts. And I thought, oh, it's hot. We're in the Bahamas. What are we doing in all these long sleeve shirts? And it turns out when you are working on sharks for a long time, you can get shark rash. And so that's the, the most pain I've ever felt from a shark. And it was really more just like a, like a rug burn. All Have right. you ever been hurt by a shark? <laughs> Probably not here in Guelph, Ontario. <laughs> OK. Um, another group joining us online uh, from Orangeville, Ontario. Um, so again, not too far from me, about 40 minutes. They're wondering, what's the biggest shark you've seen? Biggest shark I have seen has been a tiger shark, and he was almost four meters. So yeah, he was over 12 feet long and was swimming very, very, very slowly over the top of my head while I was um, looking at some other sharks. Oh, that's amazing. Sounds amazing. Um, Mr. Moore's class in Toronto, Ontario, if your microphone's working. Are we good or? We can hear you, yeah. Super, here we go. What are the essential needs of survival for sharks? The essential needs for survival of sharks are really just to swim as far as they need to and they can get the food that they like and with different species of sharks this will range some like stingrays some like small fish some like sea turtles some like large fish and so they need to be able to swim they need to be able to eat and then a lot of times um, sharks they need their fins because they are what are called ram ventilators not every species of shark the majority of them need to have air flowing over their gills in order to oxygenate them so that they can breathe. And so when I say they need to swim, I really mean they need to swim so they can breathe. All right, and go ahead with one more question, Mr. Moore's class. What is the shortest shark ever? Ooh, the shortest shark ever. I believe, let me think about that. Hmm. I might have to Google it, but there is a ah cat shark. It's not smaller than a cat shark. Probably Mr. Grabowski can help me out on this one. The shortest shark ever. I've just looked it up, and what comes up in Google is the dwarf lantern shark. So a member of the dog. Dwarf fish. lantern shark. And how short is it? Um, eight point three inches. Wow. Thank you. Thank you All for right. stumping me. Don't, don't take that for sure because you should always double check, especially something like Google. But that's what came up. Um, let's see. Recess just ended, so you can probably hear kids moving through my room. But let's join um, Mrs. Harshaw's classroom. Let me turn your microphone on in Hamilton, and you guys can ask a couple questions. Um, we want to know if uh, Jess is going to work with other marine life as opposed to just sharks. Ooh. Yes. So I spent about a year and a half working in sea turtle conservation in Panama, Costa Rica, and Guatemala. And then what's interesting about sharks is that they are associated very, very closely with tuna fisheries. And so I spend quite time talking about the ecosystem that sharks survive in, so whether or not the fish below them in the food chain are in you know, sufficient populations to feed them, but also whether or not other fish get caught in, um, in fisheries that also catch sharks. And so we try to make sure that the entire ecosystem is balanced, and that forces us to work with uh, species other than sharks. And... Um, we want to know how, how do sharks feel? How do sharks feel? I don't know that, unfortunately. Um, there are a few ways to tell when a shark is, um, is uh, getting angry with you or getting uncomfortable because sharks generally, their fins are their way that they show us how they're, how they're feeling. 
And while we can't say it's happy or it's sad or it's hungry, you know that if we begin to, say, harass a shark and we keep getting closer and closer while we're in the water, sharks will show us by putting their fins down. They'll sometimes arch their backs. Sometimes they'll spin in circles. Sometimes they show their teeth. And this is sort of like a dog. When a dog gets you know, grumpy and they want to be left alone, they might growl or you might see the hair on their back stand up. Sharks do something similar, but it takes... It takes quite a bit of pestering of a shark to make this happen. And when you see that, you know it's time to back away. All right. Great questions coming from everyone. Um, we haven't visited our class in British Columbia yet. Um, I just, you're a little too low. I can't reach your microphone. So if you don't mind turning your microphone on and uh, asking Jess a couple questions. Okay, I think we have you now. I can hear the sound okay. in the background. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, Marina. What kind of certifications need to uh, do your kind of work? So I'm sorry, I, could you repeat the question? What kind of certifications do you need to do your kind of work? What do you okay. need? Uh, to do your job. What sort of certifications do I need to do my job? Well, my job, unfortunately, doesn't mean I'm in the water 24-7, so I have to be really good at researching on my computer. And so that means when I have a question, I will search for multiple sources, read many books, and talk to a lot of people to try to understand the answer to my question. So I have to be really good at research. And then when I am in the water, I have to be good at diving and good at being calm. And so I have um, scuba certification, and it doesn't matter what level you have of scuba certification, but the higher scuba certification you have, the more you're able to do. Um, I also, um, I've spent some time learning how to properly handle sharks to ensure that I am keeping them as safe as possible when I'm doing the research. And this required me to spend time in the field with shark researchers who've been doing this a long time. And then also, I'm going to graduate school so that I can then lead others and teach others on how best to do this. And so I would say you, you need a college degree. You need to go to university. You need to be comfortable in the water, comfortable on a boat. But most importantly, you have to be very curious and be willing to, to explore, not just outside um, and underwater, but also explore all of the different avenues for information that there are to answer your questions. All right, great answer. Um, one more from our class in British Columbia. What did, what did it take to develop the shark, shark sanctuary? It's hard to say. Sometimes I say shark sanctuary. Um, the shark sanctuary was developed um, first on a piece of, or first I should say in someone's brain. He had a dream to create a shark sanctuary because he knew that sharks were being um, targeted for their fins and meat and thought, we need to do something about this. And so he came up with an idea of creating a place to protect sharks. And then once we had an idea, he tried to come up with an outline, almost in the same way that you would do a book report, and say, okay, well, we need to, f we need to understand everything there is to know about sharks. And so we came up with a plan to, to understand the science. And then because we were working in a place where there are people, and the people interact with sharks, and this is um, a resource that everyone shares, so we needed to know how the people felt about sharks. So we went out to the communities, and we talked to as many different kinds of people. We talked, we talked to fishermen, we talked to church mamas, and we tried to understand how they felt about sharks and how sharks were being used um, in their communities and their lives. Then the interest is that politics... <laughs> have a large part in, um, in whether or not shark sanctuaries are created by laws and regulations. And we had to come up with a convincing argument to, to um, tell the politicians that we needed a shark sanctuary. And we did that by combining science with um, some of the economics, meaning were people catching sharks, were they making money off of it, with the culture, um, and with what the people wanted. And in the Cook Islands, it was interesting because Polynesian people see sharks as guardians in their culture. And so for them, it was a part of their history to protect sharks. And so, yeah, so just to kind of sum that up, we had science, economics, social, and then we had to have political reasoning. 
And then once we had all that together and we convinced the lawmakers, we were able to get a shark sanctuary. All right. So not an easy process, but um, you got to stick it through. And it sounds like um, that everybody did. And it's, it's an amazing thing when, when something like that happens and comes together. I want to give a shout out to a few more classrooms who just um, reached out on the event page. So we have a group from Northeast Hope School in Stratford, Ontario. It looks like they're grade ones. And then Mrs. Edgar, her grade fours are joining us from Kansas. So Jess, we have an amazing group of classrooms from all over joining us today, well into the double digits. Kia so, ora, everyone. That's how you say hello in the Cook Islands. Okay, very cool. So I'm going to squeeze two of their questions together, one from Mrs. Edgar's class and one from our class in Stratford. So the first one is, um, are there any great whites around the Cook Islands, followed by any sharks you've tagged, are you still able to keep track of them? So the white sharks in the Cook Islands, there have been no uh, recorded sightings of white sharks in the Cook Islands, but we've heard of people talking about white sharks in the Cook Islands. And so I have a good friend, Dr. Malcolm Francis. He tags great white sharks in New Zealand, and he is able to track them. And he said that they haven't yet tracked a shark in the Cook Islands, but that it is possible. And so actually something I'm going to do this year is drop a bunch of those cameras, similar to the ones that um, you saw the baby hammerhead shark swimming, and see if we can spot any white sharks. And then the second question, could you repeat, please? Oh, um, so of sharks you've tagged, have any been um, with satellite tags and you've been able to kind of keep track of them afterwards? Yeah, so um, that shark that you saw me handling in Fiji, we satellite tagged that guy and we were able to find out how far he was going, how deep he was diving for more than nine months. And then I haven't tagged um, any sharks with a satellite tag in the past, I would say, uh, year. And so there aren't currently any sharks that I've tagged that are still swimming around, but I will begin that research again as soon as cyclone season ends. Okay, and I think this is the perfect question to wrap up with. It's from Wisconsin, and they're wondering, they're landlocked, so what can kids in Wisconsin or anywhere else away from the ocean do to help sharks? Oh, there's a lot that everyone can do to help sharks. The first thing you can do is be curious, and this is what I tell everyone, whether you're landlocked, whether you live on the ocean, and whether you sharks are part of your diet. Be curious as to what, what do sharks do in the ocean? What's their role? Because until we can understand what their role is, it's hard to understand why they might need protection. So first, we're going to be curious. The second thing we can do is think about how the choices that we make sitting, whether it's in the Cook Islands or in Wisconsin, could potentially impact sharks. And I mean that from the food that you eat. You might say, okay, I have this fish. What kind of fish is it? Where did it come from? Where was it caught? Because many times people are actually eating shark and they don't even know it because they don't know, you know where their fish came from. And this, um, this is very important in places where shark is often replaced for, uh, for other fish. In the United States it's not as much. And we can think about how what we might be adding into the water stream could then affect sharks in the oceans. And so generally everything ends up in the soil or draining their way into the ocean. And so if we put a bunch of plastic or a bunch of uh, pollutants into the ocean, that is going to affect sharks because it affects the entire ecosystem and it affects their home. It's like if in our home, if there was a bunch of, um, of fumes in our home, we wouldn't be able to, to live and breathe very well. So there are things like that with sharks, where if we, if we poison their food source or we poison the reef that they need to live off of, then we're not doing them a great service. So we can be curious. We can ask questions about where our food comes from. And we can also try to make sure that everything we put down the drain and that we throw on the ground, we try to think about how that might end up into the ocean. And then that could actually impact sharks as well. So there's a lot of things you can do right from Wisconsin. Definitely. All right. Um, before we do log off today, where can students go um, to follow your work or learn more about what you're doing? Is there a website? Oh, uh, that's a great um, I do have a web construction right now, so it's called arcpacific.org, and right now you'll just see a splash page because we are in the process of um, designing some really cool interactive uh, games, videos, and then um, 
really fun stuff for kids actually. We have a humor button so we'll you know make fun of sharks because why wouldn't we because they are funny um, and then I would say in about two months time we should have our website live. All right. Well, Jess, again, thank you so much. I know uh, it's not always easy to connect from somewhere uh, as remote as where you are, so amazing that it was so clear and, and, and everything was so great for us today. I think you shared some awesome information for students and definitely inspired some future marine biologists, I have no doubt. Um, I do want to encourage anybody, if you did take pictures, if you're viewing along, please share those pictures on Twitter or send those pictures uh, to me. Uh, you can use the hashtag Sharks for Kids or S4K Hangout, and uh, we'd love to see those pictures. I'm sure Jess would love to see some of them too. And maybe before we log out, uh, just a reminder to check out SharksForKids.com and take part in some of the curriculum activities, some of the interviews, uh, some of the pictures and the videos. Uh, we've got great videos up on our YouTube page, including a really cool one called I Spy Sharks, with all drone footage taken in the Bahamas of sharks. It's really, really cool. So. Classrooms, I think we should say thank you and goodbye to Jess. I think we should do it by putting our fins up. I'm going to turn your microphones on, and if everybody can put their fins up and show Jess how much we appreciated our hangout today. Here we go. Microphones coming on. Say goodbye and thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. We're loving up today. Jess, thank you so much.